bonus bankroll is yours. Just take it. You must be 21 and over to bet. Do you or someone you know have a gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER today. So I ended up talking about one football team that I am very close to. And now joining me is Ben Bobek. Hi, Ben, as we get set to talk about another football team that's so close to my heart in the Pittsburgh Panthers. And yeah, Ben, where should we start? Huh? We said at the same time, knock on wood. Where do we start, Ben? I don't know. Let's just start with the score. Welcome. Thank you for joining me on the show. How are you doing? How was your weekend? It was all right. It was all right. I will say I did end up uh, getting into Heinz Field and going to that game in person, which depending on how you look at it, made it either a little bit better or just that much worse. <laughs> I'd say that much worse because when this, when when Notre Dame scored first and then Pittsburgh went down and scored a field goal, I was like, okay, okay, there we're we hanging. And that was it. That was it. The game. Three, three, okay. Three. So let's see. They lost the game 45-3. to three. Total yards, 434 yards, 162 for Pitt. Three turnovers didn't help. Where do you want to start in talking about that game yesterday? Well, I'll start here. First of all, I will say last week when you had me on, uh, the over-under the over -under was still at 50 on Monday. So I'm going to take credit for that little check mark there. <laughs> As for the Pitt spread, you know, not close at all. Um, I'll, take, I'll take the blame for that. You have to start with, I think, with the coaching staff. I mean, like we talked about last week, it's, this is the fourth straight game for this Pittsburgh defense, allowing 30 or more points. They allow 45 this week to Notre Dame, who, despite coming in at as the third-ranked team in the country, I, I don't know how to put this without sounding like a bitter fan, but they really didn't do anything to impress me. I'm still not sold on <laughs> Ian Book as the dynamic playmaker that's going to carry – the Irish to the playoffs. I'm still not sold on this Notre Dame team as being the one to be up there with the Clemsons and the Alabamas. I know you want to get into that a little more in depth later, but I, I look at that game and I really see it as a pit loss. You know, Notre Dame did their job. They came out, they executed, they put up 45 points on the board. But when I look at it, I put this loss squarely on the shoulders of the coaching staff. Pitt did not look prepared. Pitt did not look ready to play. And it really showed on the field. And I think probably the most telling is with just under a minute and a half left in the second quarter, Pitt has a, I want to say a fourth and about four. Maybe it was closer to two. I don't remember off the top of my head. I was already beyond angry by then. But <laughs> you're inside Notre Dame territory at around the 40. And Pat Narduzzi, offensive coordinator Mark Whipple, decides to punt. And mm -hmm. the punt gets blocked and returned for a touchdown. And when you talk about instant karma, it doesn't get more instant than that. It was a surrender move. It was a cop-out move. And it perfectly illuminated everything wrong with this football team in 2020. Pat Narduzzi, the head coach, has talked about how this team, how the senior leadership feels different this season. It looked it after that 55 nothing blowout in week one off over Austin P. It hasn't looked like it since. There's something wrong with the rudder on this football team. So if there's something wrong with the rudder on this football team, how many more games or rather seasons, and I don't like to bring this up, do you give no. Pat Narduzzi? Yeah, I mean, that's and that's the, you know, multi-million dollar question at that point. You know, you gave him a seven-year extension to be your head coach for the significant, you know, period moving forward a couple of years back. I think he still has, I want to say, five or six years left on that extension. But that's the question that starts to be asked. You know, he had two eight-win seasons. Beyond that, his best win was seven and seven and a blowout in the ACC title game. You have to look at the the scheme he's brought in, the culture he's developed, where it's so reliant on defensive performances, and yet in a season where on paper it looked to be his best team yet, especially defensively, when you return so many seniors on that side of the football, and the performance has regressed to just an absolutely abysmal state. When you look at what that unit was able to accomplish last year, being 
top of the nation in sacks, being top 10 in yards and points allowed per game. And here they are this year allowing, you know, nearly 400 yards and 30 points per game in the ACC conference. It's simply unacceptable. And so whether it's, you know, you look at the bye week this week, I thought maybe there would be some sort of coaching change announced by now. You know, Narduzzi and the staff trying to light a fire under his players and fix something around the around the facility. But, you know, nothing so far. We'll see if anything changes by the time they kick off against Florida State next weekend. But something's got to give. You know, I don't know. I'm not going to come out and say it's time uh, to make a change at the top just because, you know, with the financial predicaments, all of these universities seem to find themselves in given the current state of our world right now, it's hard to, you know, make that move. It's hard to make that guarantee of however big the buyout is. But you have to look at, especially the offensive staff and the play caller in Mark Whipple, and just say that's not good enough for where we want to be as a football team. And there needs to be changes, you know, made at the top. And there needs to be kind of an addressing of how this situation came to be and how, you know, Pat Narduzzi's offense kind of, found itself in this spot yet again. Since letting go, since letting Mark Canada, Matt Canada, excuse me, go to LSU after his mm-hmm. first year head coach, of course, he then went on to Maryland where he was the interim head coach. Now he's the quarterback's coach uh, over at the Pittsburgh Steelers. He's done nothing to replicate that sort of offensive success that he found with James Conner and Nate Peterman in his first year at head coach that got him eight wins and to the pinstripe bowl in New York. He went with Sean Watson. That didn't work out. Fired after two years. He went with Mark Whipple. That's not working out. Should be fired after two years. We'll see if anything happens. Narduzzi needs to seriously address how he's building his offense from the ground up. You're going to have a new quarterback likely next year, whether it's Joey Yellen or Davis Bevel or even Nick Patty. We'll see. None of them really sold me on being the future in that game over Notre Dame, given that they all got you know some sort of significant playing time except for Davis Bevel, basically. But more importantly, Mark Whipple did not sell me on being able to develop this pit offense going forward. Man, and not only was that pit offense putrid, but I like seeing the little makeshift basketball court and they would dunk after a celebration. It's like, we haven't seen that in a long time. No, it's been, <laughs> and it's, it's been a couple days. It's been a couple days. But the beauty of pit losing is Penn State also lost? Penn State sucked. I cannot believe that they lost to an Indiana Hoosier football team and quarterback Michael Penix Jr. I didn't think he's got got it over the power. I don't like that. I, I don't like that whole if you knock over the little orange pile on that means you scored a touchdown or two point conversion, whatever the play is. But hey, they counted it. What'd you think of the game? Well, I mean, I was, so I was lucky enough to kind of, I was monitoring like the last minute of that game in, uh, on my way back from the stadium. Right. And I get back, I think overtime was just starting as we were able to get it up on television. And I mean, that was just an incredible ending to a fantastic game. You know, Indiana, the story of the Hoosiers football team has been, they're kind of in this position there, but they're never able to finish. They're never able mm-hmm. to kind of close the game and actually pull off this upset. I forget the exact uh, day, but I think it was their first win versus, you know, a top 25 team since like 1976, 1980s. I mean, this is a Hoosiers team that has been so close over the last couple of years. You have to admire the job Tom Allen has done. I mean, that's just the definition of a basketball school. And what he's mm-hmm. able, been able to do in terms of, you know, in-state recruiting and building that team back up to a point where they're able to compete at a high level in, you know, one of the nation's toughest conferences, one of the nation's, nation's toughest divisions going up against the Penn States, the Ohio States, and the Michigans year in, year out. You have to give credit to him. But, you know, James Franklin, time in, time out. This is a team that wants to compete at the highest level when it comes to Penn State. So far, they haven't been able to do that. We'll see if this is a loss similar to, you know, that pit loss back in 2016. It's able to galvanize the team and get them back to where they want to be competing for uh, for a conference championship. But like we talked about a little bit last week, with only an eight-game season, it's going to be very tough 
the Nittany Lions to get back to the conference championship game. Yeah. Year. And I feel bad for Devin Ford, that fourth quarter. He wasn't supposed to score the touchdown, and he scores the touchdown, and that's what opens the door for Indiana. And you see him looking at the sideline as he's just about to realize, oh, my gosh, I'm falling over, and I score a touchdown. And we also saw that in the NFL this, yeah. to this weekend, too. So it's like even for Devin Ford, he probably was on Sunday like, okay, well, it happens to the pros, too. But this could really cost the Nittany Lions, or does it? Because as our next topic goes, I cannot make sense of these college football rankings. How is OSU number three? They played one game. Notre Dame has played six games so far, and they moved down a spot to number four. Like, I just don't understand what we are doing here. And I've got more to, to that, that I could go into it. Um, but I'd like to hear your thoughts on where you fall with, with trying to rank these teams. Because obviously, this is going to go into the, the BCS bowl game, right? Eventually, they're going to do BCS rankings. And I just don't understand how they're going to do that with the uneven scheduling this season. Yeah, I mean, and that's the that's the big question for the college football playoff committee this year is how do you factor in a team like Ohio State that you know has only played one game, but they went in, you know, they went up against Nebraska, a depending on how you look at it, a good football team. You know, Adrian Martinez and Scott Frost still very capable. You know, depending uh, on, on how you look at the Big Red in the last couple seasons, but you know, how do you factor in the fact that this Ohio State team is only going to play eight games going up against, you know, say a Notre Dame who could possibly be coming in at 10 and one after a full conference slate, which is not something we've been able to say about Notre Dame mm -hmm. in the past years. Um, and, and that's the big question is how do you compare, you know, Ohio State? Look, I, I still, I agree. First, let me say this. I agree with the rankings this week. I think Ohio State is undoubtedly, undoubtedly a better team than Notre Dame. Whether or not they deserve to be a spot higher than the Irish, of course, like you mentioned, after basically playing half their season, finishing undefeated, and Ohio State coming in, winning one game, that's, you know, that's a little iffy. Mm -hmm. But I do think that if you want to go off pure merit alone, Ohio State is a better football team. Like I mentioned, I'm still not sold on Notre Dame. I think the big the big game with Notre Dame obviously is going to be in two weeks. They go up against Clemson. Um, it's going to be really a better gauge of where the Irish are as a football team, where Brian Kelly has them. I think this last weekend was supposed to be a big test for them. It was supposed to be, you know, going up against your rival on their turf, you know, going up against one of the supposed better defenses in the country. But unfortunately, Really, I feel bad for the Irish that Pitt just fell flat on its face because that mm -hmm. was supposed to be a win that they can take to the committee and say, look, we, you wanted us to play a conference schedule. Here we are. We're playing a conference schedule. Pitt gave us a good shot, and here we are. But now it's just looking like another complete blowout because Pitt simply did not show up for that game at all. And so we're really just going to have to wait and see on, on Notre Dame whether they can compete with Clemson or not. It's just, you know, I think – to look at the bigger picture, and, and you really broke it down well, there needs to be a real governing body. I feel like the NCAA is just, I know it's been tough with this pandemic, but this isn't the first time we've talked about the NCAA not having control of football and even basketball, and it's really the conferences and the presidents of the different schools that really just determine what goes on in college football. And it's just like, no. There has to be something where everyone is following the same rules, the way we're going to do this, or else it's just total chaos. And that's what I feel like it is. And it doesn't, to me, it's like, okay, fine. Ohio State was ranked number two in the preseason polls, but they played one game. And I just don't quite understand how you can do that. Um, a player who may not be playing any more games is Wisconsin quarterback Graham Mertz. Um, he's awaiting, uh, you test positive. What does that do to a Wisconsin team when, you know, who's, who's, I guess next man up, but that's really your season right there. Yeah. I mean, you know, you have to, first of all, give credit to Grant Mertz for an absolutely fantastic game. Uh, you know, week one on Friday night against Illinois. I mean, one incompletions, you know, I think it was four or five touchdowns 
throwing around 250 yards passing. You know, Paul Christ and that Wisconsin team, they're not known for developing quarterbacks. I mean, you go way back, sure, you get Russell Wilson as a transfer from NC State. But, you know, guys like Jack Cohn uh, just simply aren't lighting it up for the Badgers. You know, this is a team that's built off the Monty Balls and the Melvin Gordons, not necessarily their quarterback play. And finally, you know, they it seems like they got their guy. They got that explosive uh, kind of uber game manager, so to say, uh, in Graham Mertz. He's a fantastic debut as a freshman, like you said, against Illinois Friday night in that big win for the Badgers. And it comes out right afterwards. He may not be in for at least three more games. And that's a tough situation. You know, that's the reality of college football in 2020. Uh, you saw it a little bit here with Pitt. We've seen it all over the country down in Virginia Tech, you know, out Baylor, where depending on, you know, false positives, false negatives, you know, with some teams testing daily, some teams testing twice or thrice weekly, you know, different companies doing different tests. It's just, it's the wild west out there when it comes to knowing whether or not you're actually positive, knowing whether or not you're actually contagious and knowing whether or not you're going to be able to play come Saturday. And so right now it seems, you know, you look at the situation we talked a little bit about last week again, when it comes to Nick Saban, where he tests positive on a Wednesday, three negative tests later Mm -hmm. on Friday or on Thursday, Friday and Saturday, he's able to coach the game. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, the simply not knowing it's there's so many different factors moving at once um and you know when you look at the policy of you know 21 days on a restricted list 21 days out of action that's the you know penalty for starting the season so late and trying to condense so many games into this season when you have to be as stringent as possible when it comes to you know protecting possible positives because there's simply no room for an outbreak like we've seen at some other teams. And so Mertz is going to have to, if this positive is confirmed, is going to have to sit for three weeks. And, you know, it leaves Wisconsin in, you know, kind of a a tough spot because you had started to build that momentum with that big win over Illinois. And now where do you go forward? Do you turn back the cone? You know, Mm -hmm. what's the quarterback play going to be like? And like you mentioned, how is that going to affect their rankings? Is the committee, are the voters going to have to assess that and be like, look, this team isn't playing with their you know, first string quarterback. If he does come back after these 21 days, how is that going to affect his play? It's another big question to add to all of the things that need to be considered come ranking time. Yeah. Uh, let's move ahead. We're going to move ahead. And then it'll be interesting to see what happens with Wisconsin. I hope he's not positive i mean i don't want anybody to get covid and uh the coronavirus but if he is i wish him the best in his recovery um let's let's look at next week we got that big matchup coming up between the two teams we're talking about ohio state and penn state right now ohio state is favored at minus 12 and a half the over under is 62 and a half uh money line minus 560 for ohio state plus 360 for penn state who do you got in that game the points, the points is a big number. I'll put it like that. Okay. Um, I, I think Ohio State wins. You know, I like I said, Indi- uh, Penn State, excuse me, didn't show me much against Indiana. They're still missing Micah Parsons. It doesn't look like they'll have Journey Brown, uh, the star running back for most of the season. Uh, Sean Clifford, I've never been sold on him. He's a good running quarterback, but, you know, passing downfield, he's, you know, mistake prone. I think he had two or three interceptions against the Hoosiers, that's not going to be good enough to beat you know, the best team in the conference in Ohio State. I think Justin Fields is on a mission this year to get his team to the national championship and prove that perhaps he is, if not the best, then the second best quarterback in this upcoming draft. I think the Ohio State University is going to be on a mission, and the next stop on that train is Happy Valley. I think they're going to come out with the victory over Penn State. The 12 points makes it a little iffy. You know, I'm inclined to take Ohio State to start with, but, you know, Penn State in in Beaver Stadium as a two-touchdown underdog, that's a tough sell for me. Okay, tough sell for you. Um, Number three, Ohio State versus, I think, what, Penn State's now number 10. Uh, If I last, I think I looked at it, but I made that number wrong. But anyway, let's see what happens there. Now, the other matchup, Notre Dame. 
can they match Clemson? Maybe if they can score more than 73 points against Georgia Tech, maybe they get the respect they deserve. But right now they are favored at minus 19 and a half points over and under at 56, minus 1250 uh, for Notre Dame and plus 700 is the money line for Georgia Tech. What are your thoughts? Can they get over 73 points? Well, I think no matter what they do, I think they get over uh, 19 and a half or whatever the spread was. I mm -hmm. think that's a little small when you talk about disrespect, when you talk about you know how Notre Dame looks on paper. That's a perfect example of that. I think they're easily a three touchdown favorite over Georgia Tech. That defense uh, for Jeff Collins just hasn't been there so far. Like you mentioned, giving up 70 plus to Trevor Lawrence and the Clemson Tigers. Notre Dame's offense is explosive. I'll give them that. You know, they have that big play potential when you have, you know, so many large wide receivers going downfield. You know, they're a big team. I don't see them matching Clemson. Um, I don't see, you know, whether they can hold Georgia Tech maybe under the seven points that Clemson allowed. That's the question. Um, but I don't see uh, the Irish matching up. Um, I do think it will be, you know, their second blowout in a week. Um, I see them covering, you know, the three touchdown spread, but I don't know about, you know, putting up. Putting up seven. <laughs> so they, I mean, the thing is, it's like they may need to, but just as you said, they put up 48 against Pitt and it probably hurt them because Pitt couldn't score. Like it's, yeah. that's really tough. Thank you, Ben. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Have a good one.